Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Dean on, who is a paleontologist. Hi, Dean. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very, very good. Very good. Good stuff. Let's jump straight in then. Do you want to tell everyone a bit about what you do, Dean? Yeah, no problem. So I'm a paleontologist, as you say, which I pretty much get the chance to, to live out my childhood dream of, of genuinely digging up dinosaurs and studying <laughs> fossils. <laughs> it literally is a, a, a childhood dream come true for me. It's uh, something I've been wanting to do since I was a little kid. And uh, yeah, I get to do that now. I, well, I've been doing that professionally for over a decade. So I think it's come up to 13 years. I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, coming up to 13 years now thinking about it. And uh, as part of that job, it's, yeah, there's it's a lot more than just digging up dinosaurs, of course, but we'll, we'll get into that, I'm sure. Mm. So where did this passion come from then? You mentioned, you know, you, you always loved dinosaurs from, from very young age, but where did it come from, do you think? Yeah, yeah you, you know, I was one of those kids, you, you know, the type of kid who's that annoying child telling you dinosaur facts and figures, you know, and, <laughs> and that, that, that was me. And I still do that, you know, I get to do that now as part of my job. <laughs> so that time as a child came in, came in real uh, well that time as a child uh, gaining experience reading about dinosaurs and talking about them all came in very handy but it, it ultimately it comes from you know since oh, since as far back as i can remember genuinely i've been fascinated by all things dinosaur fossil related anything anything natural history or to do with animals i've always had animals growing up i've always had pets and things and i couldn't I couldn't actually say, I couldn't put my finger on it and say, yep, this is the, the moment I, you know, I like dinosaurs and, and, and like paleontology. It, it just seems like it's always been there. And uh, from, from my family side of things, there was nobody in my family who ever had an interest in paleontology. So it genuinely just come from within it. It may well have been as simple as playing with toy dinosaurs that, <laughs> <laughs> that captured my interest. But as a as a kid, I used to watch a lot of the, the movies and things and TV shows and and obviously you can mention I can you know can imagine I'd mentioned Jurassic Park, but yeah. when that came out, which was ninety three, I was only three or four years old, so I don't don't recall watching that until I was a little bit older. But I do remember watching the Land Before Time series. Either of you remember that? Yes, absolutely yeah. brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that was a that was a special film, especially the first one was uh, was, was quite something. Yeah, I yeah, remember one of them good. was quite sad. I remember that VCR. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I remember there was yeah, there was a very sad moment in that. It was a bit like the uh, the Bambi scene, you know, obviously at the beginning yes, of the film where Bam Bambi's is. mother gets uh, gets shot and dies, which is dreadful. But you know, I mean, it's a it's, spoiler it's a good, alert. Yeah, it's spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah, hey, I should shut up. <laughs> I'll not say too much what happens in Love Before Time, but something similar. And I guess for for growing up, it's one of those things. It's a way of children kind of dealing with their emotions and, yeah. and learning about loss and things. But it's uh, in the scheme of things with, with Land Before Time, I used to yeah, I really love that. I uh, <laughs> love, love that film and, and the whole series that came off the back of it. And yeah, maybe maybe from watching those movies, from watching while well, playing with dinosaur toys and, and stuff like that maybe that's where it really really came from and of course you know reading books and, and things yeah like that. How, how did you sort of carry it on though because obviously you know i think we all go through probably a dinosaur phase but you stayed in it um well what did you do going through you know uh, secondary school and then going into your um higher education what did you do to further your interest in this uh, field mm. Yeah, it's funny you say about we all go through a dinosaur phase. I guess for me, I just never grew up, right? <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not a bad thing. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. That's that's for sure. It's uh, yeah, it was interesting going through school. So as I got older, I I guess my my mom especially, but my parents, my family, all kind of figured it'd be just you know just a phase that, I, that everybody goes through. And as I got to my teen years, perhaps it'll just disappear. I become interested in other things and. And that, but it, it it just continued to get stronger. And as I got to, you know, I, I should say, I, I had sort of owned fossils and collected fossils since probably about the age of maybe six or seven. I still remember collecting one fossil when I was, I think I was nine years old as part of a school trip to Castleton. <laughs> I still got that fossil as well. It was a fossilized coral that was about 350 million years old. <laughs> Which is uh, yeah, it was neat. Um, but but no, I, I as I got continued going through school, collected more fossils, started to buy fossils to learn from because I thought I found that that was really important, especially as I got to my teen years, where uh, where it was very clear that this it was still something I really wanted to do as a profession. But of course, the problem became 
as you can imagine with something like paleontology it's such a niche and very unusual field and a lot of people still ask me oh is that a real job <laughs> uh, you know i still get that and we always laugh other, other colleagues of mine get that too and yeah so going through school going through sort of uh, primary school especially you know that that fascination has continued got to secondary school and and it was absolutely still there continued to collect fossils buy fossils to learn from and and that and as it got to my kind of GCSEs, I guess. So what's that age, sort of 15, 16? Mm. I, um, I was still, you know, massively into paleontology. That's all I, all I was kind of sleeping, eating, everything was paleontology. And um, in school, academically, you might be surprised to, to learn. I was, I was really poor academically. I wasn't, wasn't very good. I was more of a kind of CD student at best. Right. Okay. And yeah. And, and with my GCSEs, I just about scraped by. I actually failed science, would you believe? No way. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a, um, I got two Ds in science, and so obviously that's a fail. You know, going going higher and, and whatnot. You know, looking at grades to go and get then do uh, A levels here in the UK. And and I, um, yeah. So for having the the two Ds, I actually wasn't allowed to do A level biology, which is a, a degree that I would have needed to, for university. And A level so, yeah. biology super hard as well. It's, yeah it's, it's yeah so hard did you did you do that then uh, yes but I, I i don't have actually uh i think i've probably got a d or something it's um it's a ridiculous subject no oh, i can yeah i can imagine i imagine you know because uh, because of my poor grades at gcse and plus i didn't pass math either either so i i just about scraped by i remember gcse is my best grade i think was a b in geography and even that i was surprised myself and uh any, anyway so when it got to sort of a levels i wasn't able to do biology and, and you know looking forward and looking at the potential of a career in paleontology and from speaking to museum professionals and people who, who are in the in the profession itself you know when i'm yeah, I'm thinking sort of 16, 17, they're all saying, oh, you know, Dean, for, for university, you're going to need three A's or, or sort of A, B, B at the very, very least to, to be able to get accepted onto a, onto a university um, course to, to study paleontology or, or a similar discipline as an undergrad. And so I'm already thinking, yeah, this is going to be way, 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 way too hard for me to achieve, you know, considering I wasn't even allowed to do A-level biology. Mm. And so I... I also, I should point out as well, I, I didn't have the finances to go to university either. So I, I come from quite a, you know, pro probably the best way of putting it is a working class family background, mm. uh, you know, where my family had really struggled each month to sort of find money, enough money to pay for bills and things. So we weren't in a financial position to go to university anyway with my, you know, the lack of qualifications and, and A-levels and stuff, but also from the financial side of things. And so with my career, it was a little bit, little bit different so throughout the entire time in school that passion was constantly there but when it came to a levels i i say i couldn't do any science i ended up failing both a levels that i did take which was I remember it was english and technology i think technology i got an e and technology i think it was an e or i scraped a d mm. and so obviously i didn't have anything here i couldn't go to to uni and so I had to think outside the box a little bit. And luckily, I I spoke to a, this is very random, spoke to a supply teacher who was kind of brought in to help sixth form students to kind of reach their goals and things. And and he, uh, I explained what I want to do. His first reaction was, uh, what the hell is a paleontologist? <laughs> <laughs> and um, then we had a good long conversation. And I said, look, I, I've been thinking about experience, volunteering and things like that to kind of open up open up my professional experience and bearing in mind obviously at this point I'm 18 years old but anyway mm. long story short with that he managed to get in contact with a museum in America and, and set something up wow well what happened there yeah. then what what that's pretty cool what did you just speak to a teacher he's like yeah I've got contacts in the US and uh you can go, <laughs> go on a dig or something yeah I mean it was kind of like that you know it, they this this chap the teacher I, I still keep in touch with him he's a, such a great guy is uh his name was Renato Bonacorsi. So he's a, he was of an Italian sort of what descent. What a name. Yeah, it's such that a great a name. Yeah. Name. yeah. He always teases me now over the years. He's saying, Dean, you need to name a dinosaur after me. It's Bonacorsi Saurus. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that'll be a mouthful. Uh, but uh, he he actually, he got on the phone. Uh, this was, so going back to you, this is the last, literally like the last month of sixth form in, in 2008. And he got on the phone to the Natural History Museum and a bunch of universities around the UK and, and basically kept saying, look, we've got I've got this lad here who really is passionate about paleontology, but he doesn't have the 
grades, doesn't have the finances, etc., to go to uni. And, and he got the same kind of response that I was getting, you know, a few years before when I was 15, 16, 17, that, you know, you, you, you really have to have these grades, you must go to uni, etc. So we kind of, between us, we kind of come up with this idea of, you know, what about again, this sort of first hand proper experience, as it were, in America, because I'd, I'd been traveling around the UK, my mum would take me to places around the UK to go fossil hunting, to go go on kind of gain experience here in the UK, but it wasn't quite, you know, the experience that I really needed. And so I kind of put, put together this list of places, kind of dream places to visit in the, in the US that I'd found literally by surfing the internet. And uh, Renato got in touch with a few of them for me, on, on behalf of me, I put together a kind of personal statement, why I wanted to achieve and why I wanted to do this. And I still have that, and uh, which is funny to look back on. But uh, he, he got in touch with this one museum, called the the wyoming dinosaur center i kind of figure you can't get anything more dinosaur than that right <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he got in touch with them and he spoke to a chap called jeff mccoy and he rang this guy called jeff and, and jeff was literally on horseback out in white it was it's very like <laughs> that's stereotypical isn't it? yeah yeah right right exactly and a very american like midwest and he got in touch with uh yeah he spoke with with renato and Renato explained, you know, I've got this, this lad here who's, who's finishing, finishing high school. He wants to gain some first-hand experience. Could he come, you know, come do some stuff with you out in America? So we had to go through a few things. We had to have a few conversations. And um, in short, they basically said we'd be willing to, to host Dean here for, for up to nearly four months. So it's a good chunk of time. But I'd have to pay for my own flights, of course, and pay for, pay for, um, subsistence costs they'd be willing to to put me up in a house that they had it was basically what they had for interns and students there for the summer mm. and so I said absolutely let's do this so I had to raise up enough money to go out there and, and genuinely what we ended up doing Renato bless him he was uh in his spare time he was actually uh, like a singer a part-time singer yeah, so right. he did it yeah he did a mini concert for me at the school and he raised a couple of hundred pounds bless him oh, wow. um, what a lovely guy yeah honestly such a such a great guy and on top of that, what I ended up doing to, I was working, I should say, I was working a few jobs that I really, really didn't like. So I was working on, on the bar, uh, you know, it was sort of like just general sort of serving the public. I was working at Doncaster race course on the bar there as well. Um, oh, and I was working delivery too. So just, just trying to get as much money as I could, you know, cause I saw the bigger picture. And on top of that, I ended up selling my childhood collection of Star Wars figures. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, super <laughs> geeky, that, right? But um, yeah, I ended up selling Star <laughs> you, Wars. Have you got them back yet? Oh, no, 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 I haven't. No, I, I did keep a couple of them, to be fair. Although I should say one of my um, former students and really now good friends of mine, she did, bless her, she bought, bought one for me a oh. few years ago. Yeah, I was like, that's very kind of you. That's really nice. And yeah, so... Um, so sold my Star Wars collection, a bunch of other things as well, other possessions and that, and, and managed to raise up enough money to pay for the flights out to um, out to Wyoming in America. And and this was a, I should paint the picture for this. It, it was literally the first time away from family, and you imagine, you know, I guess at eighteen, being put on a sort of plane. I think I flew out of London, and I had altogether traveling was twenty four hours. And I was knackered by the uh, by the end of it. I had to take th three or four flights, including one of these tiny little jumbo yeah. jet type things out into middle of nowhere. And yeah, it two was, rows of seats. It was literally that. Yeah, yeah, literally that. And and just this just sounds really odd. It probably feels like I'm kind of rambling here, but it it, it makes sense this because you'll be like, what? <laughs> this, after all that 24 hours of traveling, right? I get there and it was say 7 p.m. at night. And the guy who was meant to be meeting me, Jeff McCoy, didn't turn up, right? So he was late. So he was meant to be there at seven. So I'm thinking, you know, hang on a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, middle of nowhere. I'm out here for four months. What's going on? And anyway, this other guy turns up. Uh, Greg, is, his name is, and who became a great friends. And, and Greg's like, you do? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, nice to meet you, know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, and I said, I thought Jeff was meeting me. He's like, no, Jeff quit today. <laughs> Oh, oh my god yeah so i'm already thinking like hang on a minute so this this is really kind of sets the scene and we're driving back and me and greg kind of hit it off straight you know i'm really tired and, and it's getting to that point where it's like really it's dusk you know it's getting dark and that and i says to greg greg i've no you know just making conversation about stuff and we're driving it's about 20 minutes drive from the little airport there and um going to the museum and and I said to Greg, Greg, you know, I've noticed a lot of deer like on the side of the road, like here, you know, we don't really see that many deer out, out back in the UK where I'm from. And, and, you know, just, just weird conversation. I said, have you ever hit any of the deer? 
And he's like, you know, I've clipped a few over, you know, for, what, 35 years. No word of a lie. You know, we talked about Bambi at the beginning. Mm -hmm. No word of a lie. Within 30 seconds, we boom, straight through no. a baby deer. Oh yeah. No. no word of a lie. And I mean, it's like, you, you know, what you see in these, <laughs> you see these videos are terrible where, you know, people hit deers. We were doing 70 mile per hour. There's nothing left of this baby deer. And genuinely, this is no word of a lie. Greg turns to him and he's like, uh, Dean, welcome to America. <laughs> and and I, and I said, not even that's thinking lunch, it. No. Yeah, yeah, that's your lunch. I, I said it, not even thinking it. I genuinely, my response was, oh dear. <laughs> it seems like a, like a very British thing. But no, I kind of set the, the tone then for the, for the yeah. summer. But it, yeah, it was, um, that then opened up anyway. So, so getting into that point here. So working with this museum, the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, I think it's important to kind of set the scene there with it. Yeah. But um, it, it then became the real springboard and, and laid the foundations for my career because I, it, yeah, it was just absolutely incredible. So you imagine for somebody who's been wanting to be a paleontologist since I can remember, who wanted to genuinely be digging up dinosaurs and living the life of the paleontologist, this museum, the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, is offers everything it genuinely has sort of 15 20 dig sites within 10 minutes driving distance from the museum wow. it's got a world-class museum with material that's from all around the world some of the some leading paleontologists work have worked there of, of, of um they've got many paleontologists on staff they have you know visiting scientists coming all the time it's it's just a, like a living breathing museum there's so much going on and so as this 18 year old from Doncaster in uh, in England it was kind of just so so mind blowing that there was so much to kind of do and and you imagine for pretty much to say that it's nearly four months of, of my time spent out there volunteering at this museum it just opened my eyes completely to the to the world of paleontology and gave me that early kind of experience to think you know what this is what I need to do and so I'd be there you know, I'd be working with um, other students, well, there'd be students there, there'd be interns, but I'd be at the weekend when they're off, I'd be straight in the museum, still doing stuff to try and just absorb as much info as I, as I could and try mm. my best to, you know, yeah, take part in digs and things. And that really was the, the, yeah, really laid the foundations for my career to come. So, so, you know, you've gone from not being allowed to do A-levels um, to going to Wyoming and going to this amazing, you know, museum. So how did that enable you to actually become a paleontologist? Yeah, so off, off the back of this trip to Wyoming, I managed to meet sort of a lot of people whilst out there and people who kind of helped me, if you like, get my foot on the ladder a bit further. And, and after lots of, lots of discussions and, and chats to some of the students, some of the professionals who I met, and a lot of them said, you know, Dean, Paleontology is such um, an unusual field and very, very niche that it kind of comes down to, and this is no word of a lie, that it's pretty much for, for kind of a, to, to be a professional paleontologist, what you, the general public's perception of it, it comes down to something like one in every 70 or one in every 100 people, you know, for that job. So wow. you, you've got so many people vying for that, that, that kind of big job as a paleontologist. It's mm. so competitive, even though it is obviously a small field. It's so incredibly competitive. And so a lot of people I was speaking to were saying, Dean, what we would say for advice is continue to gain as much experience as you can. Look at one of the main things where they, they were saying is look at doing academic research, you know, scientific papers and things. Now, with that, I is very interesting because I genuinely had never heard of a scientific paper. I had no concept whatsoever what that was. So when I heard students and, and stuff talking about papers, have you seen the latest paper here and there? I genuinely thought they meant newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I even said that to some of them, which they, they laughed about for the next month or so. <laughs> but it, but it, it was, um, it, that just kind of helps to, to build obviously my character too, that I literally come from a background where I, we, it's, there's no kind of ac academics in my family either. And so, Having this experience in Wyoming, I came back from, from Wyoming, came back to Doncaster, and I actually began then volunteering at my local my museum, Doncaster Museum and Art Gallery. I basically had a meeting with an archaeologist there, so not a paleontologist, who, with the archaeologist, a guy called Peter Robinson, who, um, who actually had a, had a real passion and interest in fossils. And he, and he said, oh, Dean, you know, based on your experience you've just got out in America, we'd be willing to have you as a volunteer here. I, I you know, I'd manage your volunteering and, and it'd come in handy because it's it's such a vital part of the, the professional, you know, future um, experience gaining that as a, getting the experience is, is really important going, going forward and, you know, as a professional in the field. So I said, 
Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So all that sort of money I'd been, I'd still continued at this point to be working these jobs I didn't like. I um, continued to to just go to the go to the museum in the day and and volunteer as much as I could. And whilst doing that, I came across this collection. I should say that Doncaster Museum, they didn't know what they had in their collection. The last paleontologist, he died in. I think I get it right, nineteen twelve. Oh, so okay. yeah, so, so probably, yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, been a while. Yeah, so it's at that time. This is end of two thousand eight. This was um, re fossilized know, at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so this is at a point where uh, I, I was like, well, you know, um, this is going to be important for me. So I just continued to go through this collection of stuff and and came across over about I think it was ten thousand fossils in the collection. Wow. And they had literally the museum staff had no clue what they had because most of it, had, well, practically all of it, had never been gone through by an, a you know by a professional. Definitely not for a long time. And the last geologist they had, she retired in, in 1983. So so they didn't have anybody with that knowledge. So obviously I've just come out of what, come from Wyoming and and you know this kid who's just full of you know passion for paleontology and, and just wanting to learn and absorb as much info. So I was kind of tasked with this this uh, going through all this material. And so looking at this, this stuff, I, I kind of, it became clear to Peter that we, we had a possibility here to create a mini exhibition, which is what I ended up doing with the museum staff. Worked with Peter and, and actually based on some of the stuff I collected from my own personal collection over the years, we put together a mini, a mini exhibition on fossils, which actually did really well. We got a lot of interest from local press and we had you know, hundreds, if not probably thousands and thousands of people come to, the, come to this little exhibition. And that gave me some really interesting experience. And that continued for probably the next couple of years doing this volunteering. Mm. Obviously, I didn't get paid a penny for this. And all the while, obviously, I'm still struggling financially. But I, I saw the bigger picture that this, this is important to gain this experience because it's going to continue to put me, you know, continue to put me to go, go, up, go continue to go up the ladder. Mm. And um, so continue to do that. And then it got to a point where it became clear that with this collection, it was really important. So working with Peter, we ended up applying for some funding and managed to get some funding so that we could work, actually pay um, pay people to work in the collection. And even though I wasn't guaranteed the job, of course, even though I, I, I'd helped to get the funding, luckily I did manage to get the <laughs> get part of the, the funding. I'd been really annoyed if I didn't. Yeah. But I, I managed to get part of a contract uh, job there. I think it ended up being for, was it a year or maybe it's 14 months, I think it was. And so that kind of gave me my first sort of big position, if you like, working in paleontology. But all the while doing this, this wasn't until kind of, was this 2010 11 during this time because i'd gained this experience out in in wyoming and then gained this experience in at doncaster museum a major thing happened for me whilst at the museum in doncaster was i i was shown on one of the days going through this 10,000 fossils i was shown a specimen that was thought to be a plaster copy of a, of a thing called an ichthyosaur which are these extinct marine reptiles you'll have seen them in documentaries and, and stuff and, and, and that they, they sort of look a bit like dolphins or sharks but there they are they're in, entirely unrelated they're not swimming dinosaurs they they are a, a group of marine reptiles and I was shown this one thought to be a plastic a plastic copy and bearing in mind again I'm 18 here I said to um there's, there's two chaps Peter and to, to Alan the education chap who, who had had the specimen in his care I said well well no this isn't a plastic copy it's it's real <laughs> and and they they just couldn't believe it and they said oh well you know we use this actively in in education <laughs> sessions at the museum <laughs> and i was like oh right well stop that <laughs> so we had we had it taken out the uh, education department and had it cleaned up and I, I was i was absolutely right we had it confirmed by a couple of paleontologists and that is really where my story kind of with academia began because this is how it all kind of connects and it's so bizarre how my career is gone because going a little bit further back back to Wyoming mm. serendipitously I met somebody a visiting professor from New York who was out there literally for about three days and her name is Professor Judy Massere and I was invited to go on a dig with Judy and, and, a, and a small team from the Wyoming Dinosaur Center and I jumped at the chance to go of course and and I met Judy and I told him about that I was going to be a volunteering at this museum and anyway I, I kept in touch with Judy so when I came across this ichthyosaur at Doncaster I spoke to her and Judy was a as it turns out she's a, a world-renowned expert on ichthyosaurs mm. and and she was approaching retirement age so she's actually she'd spent a good 15 20 30 years being this kind of expert in the field and, and so she said oh Dean you know that's really rare that's a really interesting specimen it turns out the specimen had its last meal preserved inside its stomach oh wow and yeah so preserved between its ribs with this really large sort of black mass and and in there, we had a, a fish scale and we had hundreds, if not thousands of tiny 
microscopic hook shaped objects, which were from the arms of, of squid. So we know that this thing wow. you saw about 183 million years ago was feeding on squid and fish right before it before it died. Incredible. Yeah, amazing, right? And so that that then this this uh, this story, this discovery, this ichthyosaur is then what kind of put me into the down the route of academia, and that became my first peer reviewed paper that I that I actually wrote. I began writing when I was eighteen, and, and that was published when I was twenty in um, or nineteen. It was in published in two thousand ten. I I'm 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 here with my mouth open. Your story is absolutely incredible, and I I think one of the biggest things, particularly from Dan's point of view, he's always advocate that you don't need to go to university if you've got a passion for something you can work hard and you can get to it no matter what and your story is just like it's so spot on you know you've 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 achieved more by you know just fighting for what you want and you you've got there and it's it's so amazing Oh, cheers for that. No, I, I appreciate it. And, and, you know, it was one of those things where I've had so many people over the years say to me, and, and this is one of the things where it come, a lot of it, I find it does come down to jealousy, but it's, it's, it's dropped off quite a bit in recent years, probably the last five years or so. But I, early on, when I started to write papers and I started to get a bit of a name for myself with one or two things, because now... You know, now I'm at a point where I've written about 50 scientific papers, discovered wow. new species to science. I've written various books and, and stuff like that. But early on in my career, people kind of looked down on me a little bit because I didn't do the traditional route of, of going to uni, getting an undergrad. And so with, with certain people, they were yeah looking down on me and saying, oh, you know, you, you'll never be taken seriously in this field. You need a, an undergrad degree and these things. And and I just thought, you know, I, I don't want to do it. I want to do it my own way. I want to follow my passion and, and I want to gain the experience and, and go out and do that because I'm very much one of those people who learn by doing. And, and so it, it took, where, where did it end up? Probably after the years and years of, of experience, I started to gain and I started to work in contract positions and I started to get a good name for myself in paleontology, especially in the world of, of ichthyosaurs, which... Um, might sound like a small world, but in paleontology, it's quite getting quite it's quite a big world actually. <laughs> Ichthyosaurs have been known for about two hundred years now, and and um, in, in in a scientific capacity. And it wasn't until uh, January twenty thirteen, I got chatting to a couple of, of friends of mine, and colleagues of mine, and and they said, Dean, with all your experience now, why you know we we should get you as a as a uh, an affiliation with a with an academic institution you you know you've published a lot you you now you, you you're moving on from doncaster the, my, my contract stuff had finished at doncaster and so i became i became affiliated with the university of manchester here in england and right off the bat we actually based on the experience that i took that i'd um i'd already had so the sort of field experience uh writing of papers even at this point i'd written a book i was writing in my second book at this point and they had some discussions about sort of doing a PhD right off the bat. And there was some early discussions about sort of being given an honorary PhD. And I was like, what? Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So I was like, that's crazy. But then I said to myself, you know, if I was going to do this, I'd, I'd want to do it properly. And so the only way I could do that was I, I was given an opportunity that I'd obviously written at this point. I'd written, I'd say, multiple papers, starting to make a name for myself in paleontology. And I was given the opportunity to do an MPhil. I don't know if, if you know what, what that is, but effectively it's a, it's a master's, but it's kind of like a higher master's. It's what we call a master's of philosophy, but it's, okay. uh, it's in paleontology. And, and it's, it's often at various different universities across the UK. And um, so it's kind of like the in-between, not a straight up master's, it's kind of like a slightly more advanced master's. And often people then lead on from that to do the, that sometimes becomes their first year of the PhD. And so I ended up doing that and that I completed in 2015. And it was kind of one of those things where I felt I didn't need to do it, but it, it was an opportunity. So I thought, you know what, let's do that. Uh, it might open some more doors. And after completing it, I ended up winning uh, an award for the MPhil. The, it was like the best, <laughs> best award, best award in the department. And so I was like, oh, you know, amazing. Thank you. And, and then we had some discussions about, because again, not just for the MPhil, but for my other research at the time. And I'd actually just... At this point, this was where we think in 2015, I'd written many more papers. I discovered and named a new species at this point as well. And I just presented a, a TV show as well, which you can get into that stuff a little bit later. But um, after all of this, I, I got chatting about the PhD because that came up again. And um, we said, you know, Dean, based on all of your experience and, and, and that, you know, we think you might be applicable to for the, at the University of Manchester to apply for the aptly named De Dean Scholarship Award. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway i did and managed to manage to get that and so that was um a three-year fully funded phd 
And this is obviously incredibly rare for somebody who had never gone to university, didn't have even the GCSEs, the A-levels to get to uni, let alone have an undergrad, to then be able to do a PhD and then pass that. You know, I got my PhD a couple of years ago now. And it was always one of those things where I've never felt I needed to have a PhD, never felt I needed to get the, the qualifications or, or, or get those letters behind my name. But it, but it's one of those things where it, the opportunity was made available through my hard work and it felt like it was the right decision to do. And, and I'm, I'm glad I did that because it's, it has opened up other different, you know, new doors or the doors and things. And um, so it is great that I managed to, to do that, but I've done it, if you like my, my own way, I've not gone the sort of traditional route and all the while, whilst doing the, you know, getting to this point of being able to do a PhD, I, as I say, I've, you know, I've written in that time up until now, we have, you know, 50 papers uh, named, five new species of ichthyosaurs to science, including one I named after the, the one at Doncaster actually turns out to be a new species, let alone was it being used by children in the education department. <laughs> yeah, it ended up being a new species that me and Judy Macere, who I met in Wyoming, we named Ichthyosaurus aninge, which is um, uh, in honor of a, a fantastic paleontologist who's actually, it's her birthday today. It's her 222nd birthday. Happy 222nd uh, birthday. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> she, is, uh, she was a great paleontologist from Lyme Regis endorse often it's said that the you know the famous tongue twister she sells seashells on the seashore yes. yeah a lot of people you, you taught in school that it's um it's inspired by mary anning that's not true it's not inspired by mary but it's something that i like still like to bring up because it's a cool little thing that does remind me of her <laughs> <laughs> but anyway we named it after her as ichthyosaurus anning and that was the first first species i named but then over over the last few years I, i've named a few more and one of the the cool things i named just a couple of years ago in 2019 was a little velociraptor like dinosaur which was uh, was Pretty found cool. in wyoming which was um goes back to being related to the wyoming dinosaur center as it was in their care <laughs> i mean <laughs> as as judy said um i'm a big advocate for not having to go to university necessarily because yeah. i you know you're you're it's such a great example of this um it's almost like we set this up um, <laughs> but you you know you, you struggled at gcse level in, in science and now hundreds of kids struggle at gcse level science and it puts them off you know oh i yeah. didn't get the grade yeah. because because they examine you in a certain way in every single subject, it's done on your ability to memorize and transfer knowledge essentially into the exam. Very true. It has literally nothing to do with your passion and ability to then learn that subject and, and apply it to the world. Like if you hadn't have done what you'd done and gone off to Wyoming and really pursued your passion, you know, that ichthyosaur wouldn't have been discovered. It, it, yeah, it, ju yeah. it just frustrates me that everyone is almost not false, but told you have to go to university to pursue your passion in a higher field, in, a, in an academic field. And it's just not true. You're a prime example of that. Oh, cheers for that, Dan. I, you know, and I, I completely, completely agree with that sentiment. I still remember right now, I can go back to sixth form and some of the teachers there literally saying to us, you know, you have this kind of sixth form group and they're saying you have to go, literally they'll say, you have to go to university you need to do this. If not, you're going to waste your life. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And there was so much pressure. I, I you know, I have friends or, or people I've, you know, lost sort of contact with over the years, but I know of people then, friends who were, who went to uni simply because the teachers told them to. And then they, mm -hmm. they either dropped out or they got a degree in something, but they, they're, they're now doing a job which they you didn't need a degree for. And, and yet now they're in debt by X amount of money. Yeah. And, I, and I know obviously there's the argument where you could say, well, okay, but you've got life experience. You've done this. And I understand that. But then, ultimately that money and that time and that you could have been spent doing something else and i'm not, and I'm not saying that i'm completely obviously against people going to uni and no. and things like that that's definitely not the case but um, and, and in many cases I, I people you know people do come to me and and they say oh you know dean i'd love, love to do a career like what you've done and i'll say well that's well and good but you you know you, you're not me and i you know and we're all different and and mm. there's all, all, always different opportunities that arise and, and it depends on the i always say it comes down to the individual but, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there we're all different yeah. some yeah. people are yes very academic and that's the way they you know they learn right. and they apply things but we need to get away from this one singular route to everybody doing what they want to do there are yeah. so many ways like everyone so many of our guests, Jules, you'll agree with this, have come on the show. And, you know, we've had a, a historian who didn't mm. do the traditional route. She just basically started talking about history and reached yep. out to historians and, and, and built her knowledge that way. And there's so many examples in our catalogue of people that have 
not taken the traditional route and mm. they are absolutely thriving. And I love the fact that you're another one of those. Yeah, yeah cheers. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, I do think I, I completely agree with what you said about there is so there is just so much there's so much pressure. You know, there's so much pressure on students today. And, you know, I see it firsthand as well with, you know, mm. family members, friends, but also, you know, I, I occasionally have students myself now with my affiliation at University of Manchester, where I'm, I work as an expert um, specialist and work with, with, with an undergrad student or a, or a postgrad student. And, you know, I'll talk to them, get to know them really well. And they'll, they'll say there's so much pressure on them, not just now in the, in the university life, but but when there is in school, you know, they, there's so much pressure from, you've got to remember as well, I'm sure you'll both, both appreciate, but in schools and, and it's something you don't really you don't really understand when you're you know when you're 18 you, you're not really that fussed about these things or maybe some people obviously are but but you don't understand that with schools they have their their own pressures that they need to be seen to be having you know ticking boxes that so many students do go to university yeah and, and that's so i part think of the issues is that you know, ex- yeah, exa- exactly 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 mm. um so we should probably ask this question um what is paleontology <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah what do you that, actually yeah. do? <laughs> what do you actually do, Dean? <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I should say is that uh, it often gets mixed up with archaeology. So archaeology. Let's start by saying what it isn't. So archaeology is uh, is a field where it's all to do with sort of humans and and sort of human prehistory. And often you get it gets mixed up. So a lot of people will say to me, "Oh, Dean, you, you know," I'll say, "Oh, I work with dinosaurs, fossils, and things." And they'll say, "Oh, I'm an archaeologist." And I say, "No, no, 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 no." Or you'll you'll often get compared to Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> And uh, it's not a bad comparison. <laughs> oh, definitely not. No, I'm happy with that. <laughs> but uh, with Indiana Jones, and so obviously he's like, you know, a, he's a prime kind of public fronted idea of what an archaeologist is. And, that, and for some, for sure, I'm, su- I'm sure that is the case. But uh, that's, you know, that's an archaeologist. Now, for a paleontologist, we literally, I, I, as part of my job, I, I literally look at the entire history of, of life on Earth and through, through studying fossils. So that goes way back to the first... Well, the age of the Earth, I should say, is 4.54 billion years old. So it's a, it's a really massive, unimaginable amount of time to really think about. And when we look at that and we look at the oldest fossils on the planet, which are about 3.7 billion years old, and this is these are sort of microorganisms, algae and things like that. As, as animals change, obviously, through time and, and evolution, as they adapt to new environments, different animals evolve and things. And obviously, you have a very small percentage, you, you know, to place in a context, percent of animals that ever lived on this planet are long gone and extinct we'll never know Mm. you know so what we have in the fossil record is but only a fraction of the animals and things that we we have here because fossilization is uh you know is an incredibly uh hard process it's a i've never really thought about that yeah yeah. there there were creatures that we'll never know about because they weren't fossilized yeah, yeah, exactly, that's exactly. That's mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of like the, you know the Goldilocks effect, I guess. You know, it has to be just right <laughs> for yeah. preservation of, of animals to to be reserved as fossils. And so, yeah, as a paleontologist, you know, primarily kind of the straight up thing as a paleontologist. And I should say it's also it isn't Ross from Friends. That's uh, I need to get that because <laughs> <laughs> that's always something uh, we paleontologists do get. But it's uh, you know it's a fascinating area. We get to. I kind of mentioned at the beginning, you know, I, I literally get the chance to, to go and dig up dinosaurs, and obviously lots of other different fossils, because dinosaurs only, again, make up a very small percentage of what, what paleontology is. But of course, that's what, what's in the public eye through the likes of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, and obviously is very much in your face in museums. And why not? Dinosaurs are frigging cool. Well, that's, <laughs> but, it's kind of changed recently, hasn't it? Like in the news, I've seen a lot of articles about our ideas of what dinosaurs look like is, is changing all the time. Yeah, the whole feather thing. The fe- yeah, the feather thing, the, the <laughs> yeah, T-Rex. Yeah, yeah. His feathers it's kind yeah. of ruins jurassic park a bit but <laughs> i don't know i don't know i think a big a t-rex with feathers you know like a chicken imagine like a chicken the size <laughs> a of a t-rex. that'd be quite scary <laughs> chicken with teeth yeah yeah exactly exactly but you know that's a good point that you see that you say there is that with the the field of paleontology over the last 20 30 years has changed so radically like the ideas that you know you mentioned there about feathers and things and, and even new discoveries in paleontology now have been made over the last 20 plus years of some fossils that are preserved with with such great detail that we can work out exactly what colors they were based on the fact that they have color pigments preserved in their skin or their feathers How and incredible. by com- it's amazing, isn't it? And so, so this field of, of paleontology, it's so much more than, you know, I always laugh about it saying, oh, you know, I dig up dinosaurs, which is a, is a big part of my, my work. But, but as a paleontologist, your, your job has changed so much now that we, 
Now we are out in the field digging up dinosaurs or the fossils, but that's that's such a small part of it now. There, there's lots of stuff, you know, working in museums, so working as as curators in museums. So that's taking care of the the specimens, making sure members of the public can come and see them on display in museums, creating exhibitions. There's doing lots of academic research, working out what the sort of the latest and greatest finds are. Like I mentioned, the sort of bringing bringing these animals to life, not Jurassic Park style, but bringing them to life in the sense of you know understanding their colours, what they actually were like. In, in life and how these animals behave there's also a, a big part of, of paleontology as well of course is uh, is communicating science you know science communicators that's that's become a big part of of my work as as well so it, it isn't you know i always introduce myself obviously as a you know a doctor of paleontology you know paleontologist but i'm you know very much obviously an author with the work that i, I do with, with books but a, a big part of my work has become science uh, a sci- as a has become as a science communicator so talking to you know could be groups of, of school children up to you know learned academics and a different few mentioned historians earlier it might be historians or or it could be anybody and you know and I, I mentioned this is a case where I'll go to say festivals and I'll talk about paleontology to big groups up to thousands of people or I'll I'll co-host tv shows and things one of the the big tv shows that i did a going back a few years ago is a program called dinosaur britain that was a primetime tv show for itv1 do you know what i think i watched that i did yeah oh yeah, yeah. really really yes, yeah. yes. oh yes. good yeah, good hopefully you enjoyed it yes oh, no yeah, it was so great oh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i said we all go through dinosaur phases yeah <laughs> yeah. So, yeah it's it's, it's really cool how, how do you get involved with writing papers that's obviously something that um it obviously comes with an academic uh, yeah, yeah. job, but it's how is it for you? Well, what do you get involved with there? Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I would say going back like to to Wyoming, where I'd never heard of writing papers and stuff. It was all completely new to me, and and that was genuinely the way I was kind of throwing the deep end with it. I just I was told, Dean, the best way of doing it is just read papers, and I read these papers and. Between us, you know, I, I literally had no idea. I, I read the paper and was like, the hell did I just read? <laughs> it was, yeah. you know, this I know what so, you mean. Yeah, it's so technical, right? And I was like, what? What is this? I, I'm never going to be able to write a paper. And so I, um, after finding that ichthyosaur in Doncaster and, and having the encouragement from Judy Macero, who I met out in Wyoming, she encouraged me to write this paper. And, and I've still got the first drafts of that paper and they are hideous. So, so poorly written. But it's, it is where it was my starting point. You know, it's my foot on the ladder in academia. And so I genuinely, the way in which I, I did it, I, I just started writing. I started reading. I got as, hold as much literature as I could. Some stuff I paid for. Other stuff I, I, I literally, you know, hounded paleontologists, send them emails saying, hi, I'd like to read your paper, blah, blah, and, and killed them with kindness. And, and then they sent me a copy. And I just read and read and read. And then, and then I started to kind of pick up the lingo on stuff and some of the technical literature and, and began writing. And then sort of before I knew it, can I say my first paper was published 2010. A year later, I'd published, I think, a couple more papers. And then it started to build up and up and up. And, and as I mentioned, yeah, it's about 50, 50 papers now with more in the works. And, and it just got to a point where I... I just began then collaborating with other people, researchers from around the world who other people would then come to me, you know, so, so if I published a couple of papers on ichthyosaurs, someone might have seen that paper and said, oh, Dean's the ichthyosaur person, right? We need to speak to him. And so they'd say, oh, Dean, we've got an ichthyosaur at, you know, X museum. Could you come and take a look? And I'd be like, you know what? Sure. Let me go take a look. Turns out it's really cool. Nobody studied it. It needs, needs to be described in the literature. I'd, I'd do that. I just physically go and do it. And bear in mind, I mean, I, I didn't get paid for any of this. I've um, I've literally never been paid to write a scientific paper bar <laughs> bar, bar from my uh, my PhD research. That's it. And, and, and I say paid. It's not you're not really paid to to write the papers, of course. It's just funding to to make sure you, you know, can just about survive. <laughs> but <laughs> but but no, it's, it's often with academia for me has been a, a real labor of love. And, and through doing all this research and, and getting into academia, writing papers, I've become, uh, it's always a feel embarrassed saying it, but people always point it out for me, is that I've become as a, you know, literally um, an internationally recognized expert in, in the field of not only paleontology, but specifically as one of the, the world's leading experts on, on ichthyosaurs. I love that. That's so cool. That's a cool statement. That's so well, cool. It? It's a yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> a party starter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. It's it's mad though, you know, when it, when you think of it. And and let's say I go back and I think to myself the mindset I was in in 2008 and a few years after that, I genuinely, genuinely didn't have, you know, more than a couple of quid to my name. You know, my my mum and my sister at one point, this is probably 2010 maybe, sat me down. I still remember like it was yesterday and said, you know, Dean 
you know, are you going to be okay in this field? You, you know, you're, you're working jobs you don't like, you're volunteering, not earning any money from paleontology yet. What, what are you going to do? And I said, I'll be okay. You know, I know what I want to do. I've got this drive. I've got this passion. I need to, I need to pursue it. If not, I'm just going to become disillusioned with life generally. Yeah. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to work a job that I don't, you know, I don't like. So for me, it was kind of all or nothing for paleontology. And I just wanted to make sure I could make it in any way, shape or form, but also I should say to help as many people along the way as well. So let's talk a little about your recent book that's come out. Um, so yeah. you mentioned you've, you've done a bit of TV and you're doing a lot of science communication. This forms part of that, right? Yeah, yeah, de definitely. So this book is uh, called Locked in Time. It's called Locked in Time, Animal Behavior Unearthed in 50 Extraordinary Fossils. And the kind of brief background to this, it, it's really funny in, in many ways. And I say that it's all connected my my journey and stuff and how things pan out. That going back to the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, on my very first day, I was showed around the museum by a vol another volunteer, a guy called Jordi from, from Spain. And mm -hmm. Jordi had shown me, showed me around the museum and he, and he made me stop at one of the exhibits. And he said to me, Dean, look at this cool fossil. And now he showed me, and it was like a large block of limestone. So this yellowish limestone. And, and I didn't really see much apart from what looked like sort of footprints or trampling in the surface. And I, I was kind of puzzled by this. And so I said, I'm not sure it is, Jordi. And, and he said, well, just, just stay focused on that and follow it. So this, these kind of footprints, they kind of led all the way along this limestone block. And I followed it. And 9.7 meters later, there was a tiny Jurassic 150 million year old horseshoe crab preserved dead in its tracks. Wow. And yeah, I, I was blown away by this fossil. It came from, well, it comes from a site near a place, quite a famous place in geology, paleontology called Sonhofen. And you'll, you may have heard of the sort of bird-like dinosaur called Archaeopteryx, one that was found with feathers, and that comes from Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's one of these sort of so-called transitional forms between birds and dinosaurs. And, and uh, anyway, this horseshoe crab fossil comes from there, and, and I was blown away by it, blown away by it. it, it basically, what it captured is behavior from 150 million years ago. So you had the, this entire life process of this little horseshoe crab that had left its final steps in time and then it was pre preserved forever for you know then for somebody to come along collect it for that then to be studied and it told so much about prehistoric life that i was was genuinely so captivated by it that it, it genuinely gave me the idea then this is right obviously at the beginning of my professional career i say professional loosely at this point so i was 18 <laughs> but i but i um I, it just gave me an idea to to think about fossils in an entirely different way i'd never seen anything like it and so this idea this book locked in time has been built over the the course of more than a decade of, of going through the literature seeing extraordinary fossils that are that have direct evidence of behavior so a couple of other examples in the book we have genuinely dinosaurs that have been found fighting to their death wow you know, that, yeah and that that's that's on the cover as well the cover artwork is of this dinosaur but it also photographs and illustrations of this dinosaur feature inside and this is of two dinosaurs one you'll both know velociraptor that was yeah. found with a triceratops relative called protoceratops literally found together fighting to their death and and they died during well they they, they died presumably um after a, a quite a lengthy fight because uh, the, and, and as they are preserved, I should say that the Protoceratops literally has the Velociraptor's arm and its beak and the, and the big famous infamous killing claw on the Velociraptor's foot is held right high up in the, in the air. And it's, it's in the position of the neck of the Protoceratops. Wow. So it's very likely that they died um, in that. Well, they definitely died in that position, but they, based on the geology of the site, it shows that it was probably some sort of landslide or probably triggered by, by potentially um, thunderstorms therefore triggering heavy rainfall in a in a sand dune area then covered this this extraordinary uh, this battle and then it, it led to an extraordinary fossil so it has this book effectively it's, it's unique you know we recently had a review came in from goodreads which genuinely says in, in a book uh, in, a, in a world full of books about dinosaurs this one is truly unique and it it, it you know it gave me goosebumps reading it the first time because it's it's a book unlike any other dinosaur book. It literally allows us to, to see these animals as living, breathing animals that are as, as real as, as you, you and I. You know, you, you, you look at it, uh, it gives us an unprecedented glimpse at the behaviors of these things. So from you know, the sex lives of animals. So there, there's other animals that are preserved literally whilst mating 
preserved his fossils. <laughs> yeah, imagine, you know, imagine what, that. What a way to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What a way to go, go out with a bang. So, <laughs> you know, okay. it's, and, and so um, for, for the, you know, for these fossils, it, it, and it's, it's so extraordinary. Obviously I say that the fossil record itself to anything to become a fossil is so exceptionally rare. So for, so to have an animal or, or series of animals preserved, actually doing something or showing some form of behavior, whether it is mating, whether it's an animal that's uh, pregnant or whether it's an animal that's last meal preserved or, you know, or one, one, one dinosaur I feature in there is a T-Rex that's, um, that was infected by parasites. So there, there's so much you, you can learn from, from the fossil record. And that's where it's all culminated and, and brought together in this, in this book. What What's it like being on a dig? Cause I mean, it's the, the, um, the fossil you explained earlier of having the footprints in there to see that and then go, Oh my God, like you, you find a part of it and then you trace it back and then you've got like nine meters worth of fossil. Like how, how do you even begin to find that and deal with that? Yeah. It's uh, it's such a, you know, the way I point it, it's such a, an incredible experience. You know, every time as well, every time, no matter how many digs I, I go on, how many fossil trips or hunts, whatever I go on, when you, when you find a fossil, for the first time you are the very first person anywhere in the world to to feel that you know to pick that up to see that and and you know in millions of years uh, that 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 individual is preserved over millions and millions of years to eventually to be found by you or your team it's such an incredible experience and when it comes to fossils the way in which say paleontologists go out and, and find these things because a lot of stuff I'm, i must say especially not so much now, but in the, in the past, many fossils were just found by chance. Of course, you know, you imagine here in the, in the UK, you had the industrial revolution. So there was lots of, lots of mining, lots of, um, lots of sort of factories being built left, right and center. There was um, railways being put in all, all these things. And during, during all these constructions of these things, there were, you know, fossils being found. So often, you know, it was quite by chance, but nowadays, you know, paleontologists, geologists have, plenty of uh, information often in the academic you know the technical literature available to them to be like look this these are the types of rocks you need to be looking at primarily like sedimentary rocks so i mentioned like limestones mudstones and things here's where we know these these rocks out you know crop out and you know here's a chance you're going to find fossils well if we go to let's say for example again in the uk if we went to the the yorkshire coast and we went looking for fossils and we found a fossil of a squid-like animal. Well, we know that that squid-like animal would have been living in the sea. Therefore, where that, where that fossil has been found, the environment clearly indicates an extinct, you know, an ancient marine marine environment, so an ancient sea. Mm -hmm. Whereas you might go somewhere else you know, along the Yorkshire coast and you might find dinosaur footprints, for example. And if you look at the geology in the cliffs there, you'd be able to work out that always uh, in, in rocks that have kind of, not disturbed at all by you know by um how how the plates and things change and how the geology changes and over time if you look at imagine like a cliff face where at the bottom of the cliff that's always going to be the oldest rocks those at the top are going to be the youngest so if you find say a fossil on the beach you, there is a way that you literally can work out pretty much where it came from in the cliffs and therefore the, those fossils from, from the bottom of the cliff the base of the cliff are, are older than those at the at the top so you know you might find on the, along the same location you could find dinosaur footprints those footprints clearly weren't made out in the sea otherwise they wouldn't have preserved so they were they indicate that they were preserved in a coastal sort of setting on the on the you know, on the coast like basically a dinosaur leaving its footprints in in, in mud or in, in um, sand that then preserved uh, and became fossilized and then that tells you more about that environment so that indicates that you you know, obviously you're not in the sea you're at an environment on the coast it might have been that it was was it sticky mud was it um you know was it a case as a was, was this animal on its own was it traveling in a group all these types of things but when you you know when you, when you are on a dig uh, and, and sort of like a big dig say say again I'll, I'll go back to like wyoming so I, I do a lot of work still with the wyoming dinosaur center and elsewhere mm. but most of my, my work in america is still with uh, the dinosaur center you you know it's one of those things where it's 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 very mind it's very mind-blowing and it's also the way I explain it, it's very surreal as well you know you, you you see these things in documentaries you'll read about dinosaurs and stuff and digs and things as kids or you might read in books today as adults and also you know you see obviously you, know, you see likes in Jurassic Park of course the beginning of the Jurassic Park they're digging out in Montana it's definitely not like that they made it look way too easy <laughs> you know they're just brushing the dirt off the bones it's definitely not like that you know that sometimes you're you're digging through dinosaur you're digging through rocks that are incredibly hard that you know you'll break tools on them it's that hard to actually wow. extract the bones and i've been part of digs where it's taken months and months and months and months just to get out you know partial skeletons whereas 
some digs that I'm, I'm aware of have continued for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years and, oh and longer. Word. Yeah. They, you know, because some of these things you, you can't just sort of just take it out the ground. You know, if, um, if we came across uh, an animal, a dinosaur in the ground, if we took it straight out the ground or if we took bits of it out without kind of assessing how it's preserved without fully exposing it, what, what it would mean is that we ultimately lose the science there. You know, we, um, all that information about when that animal died. So let's say its head became, uh, disattached and disassociated from the the neck the let's say the arm bones became uh, dis disarticulated so a few bones disappeared the tail became separated all these bits and pieces that's a, a process a thing what we call taphonomy and taphonomy is really important because it tells us what happened to this animal after it died you know what okay. affected it and so therefore how's it's preserved so so there's so much when you go to to a dinosaur dig or a fossil dig or even just a general fossil hunt there's so much to kind of always think about in the back of your mind and this is why i kind of bring it back going back to what i was saying a moment ago about uh, when you find a fossil for the first time it's such a, a an important thing thing to to experience you know and and anybody can experience that from you know a young child to a you know somebody retired or you know a professor or something and that's that's what's really nice and unique about paleontology that it is a it is a field it is if you like a club where everybody can contribute there's children around the world who genuinely have have actually found new species to science just by being inquisitive and, and picking up a rock or as it turns out it was a fossil <laughs> that's that's so cool and anyone listening to this thing you know i'd love to be a paleontologist what is the one piece of advice you'd give to someone thinking i want to pursue this oh that's a that's a really good question that um i would have to say is you've got to i, I just have to say you've got to gain experience that's the most important thing experience and probably if you allow me to say so experience 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 but make sure what you're doing you enjoy it yeah. so you know e even with paleontology i'll admittedly say and, and if any paleontologists who, who do listen to this well i'm sure they'll agree there are large parts of paleontology that are you know it's very laborious there are there are a lot large parts whereas um you know number crunching stuff lots of emails and stuff day-to-day -day, things like that it's not all just you know fun and games outside digging dinosaurs all day long and things you know and, and studying their bones it's um you know you, you need to when you go into paleontology if you're looking at a career in paleontology you have to look at the bigger picture and ultimately work out what what paleontology can sort of do for you and what you can do for the science as well now a lot of people do come to me and say oh dean you know i want to work on dinosaurs because dinosaurs are cool and i'll say well that's all well and good but you know there's 20,000 or whatever people already, probably not that many, but there's, there's thousands and thousands of people already working on dinosaurs. How about you try and find something else that you can get excited about that people aren't working on? Therefore, there's more chance of you actually being able to make a professional career. And uh, if people did want to gain experience, well, how can they get, go about doing it? What would you suggest? It, it kind of depends on their age for one thing so if 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 say they are you know younger so let, let's say it was children or teenagers and things 110 percent, and i'd say the same for adults actually as well for this 110 percent. the main thing you want to be doing is getting out in the field responsibly collecting fossils have a fossil collection because you, it allows you it gives you that experience of how to handle fossils how to care for them and, and to also appreciate what it what they are and um, with that in mind as well, definitely be visiting museums, go into as many, you know, many events and things that you can to, to meet with, with professionals as well, ask advice. As, um, you know, for somebody who's a bit older, for students or, or people at least from the sort of age of 18 plus, 100% get to get volunteering at places where you can, if, if, you, if you live locally to say a museum that has a fossil collection or has a geology collection, get into museums to, to just see if you can volunteer. And, and I know, of course, I should say that, you know, because I do work a lot in museums, often museums don't have the, unfortunately don't have the finances to um, to help have, you know, to actually have um, time to train volunteers. And so I know some people listening would say, oh, well, you know, my museums have turned me down or stuff like that. That's another thing where, again, I'd have to say, uh, going back to about following your passion and everybody being different, I'm not saying don't take no for an answer, but if that is the case and you're, you're in somewhere where you don't have a chance to do um, gain firsthand experience, then make sure you go out somewhere to do that. You know, if you have an opportunity to say, I don't know, say you lived on, uh, I don't know, let's just say in, in Northern Scotland and you thought to yourself, you know what, uh, there's nowhere around me, it's middle of nowhere, I really want to be a paleontologist. 
you know, make a point of, um, of finding somewhere that is remotely close to you. For example, in Northern Scotland, the Isle of Skye is actually fantastic for fossils and for dinosaurs in particular. And so, you know, you could travel and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to gain experience, you know, Monday to Friday or every day or whatever. It could just be a little bit, go, you know, a little bit goes a long way. Anything like that adds to your CV and it helps make you more of a, of a, of a sort of full rounded individual. And it gives you a, a proper insight into what it's, what it's going to be like to, to potentially be a paleontologist. Mm. Awesome. Um, what is something that's maybe something not in the job description, something you just never expected to have to deal with um, going into this industry? Oh, that's, that's good. I, you know, I, I touched upon it obviously briefly before. I, I'd have to say the TV side of things, never, mm. never in a million years, no, no pun intended, <laughs> but never, never in <laughs> a million <laughs> years, <laughs> never, never in a million years did I anticipate that I'd be, you know, co-presenting a primetime tv series watched by millions of people it's mad and and you know obviously since that and before that i've done quite a lot of other tv things and that is something where i yeah i never thought i'd do that and it's something which even today if i'm brutally honest i still feel sometimes uncomfortable with and i can get quite nervous about it and anxious because i'm not you know i'm not a trained professional in the tv world and and so you know i i am at heart i am a professional paleontologist i'm a scientist and so when when you're you're doing TV stuff, you've got to remember that you're speaking to a very very different audience, and that's where you have to not to use the old sort of mundane expression of think outside the box, but you very much have to do that because it's important to to look at the bigger picture again here. And this is why I say if you can gain any sort of experience before you kind of go into paleontology, professional, whatever, again, kind of communi- science communication is is important. So if, if you know if you are someone listening to this and you genuinely like dinosaurs and fossils and you want to be a paleontologist and there isn't now, there isn't a somewhere near you where you can go and gain volunteer, you go, go and volunteer and get experience. You could easily find local groups. It could be, you know, I don't know, it could be something as random as a knitting group, and you could actually speak to them about dinosaurs, gain that experience. It sounds random, it sounds a bit silly, but it, it's true. It gives you that that experience to speak in front of people, and um, that all really does does come in very very handy. And and as I say, that that would come down for me the stuff to do with TV, especially. It was, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with some really interesting people. I've had the privilege to to do some stuff with Attenborough. You know, I've, I've oh, cool. met some, um, yeah, amazing. You know, and, and these are things which I say I'd never, never would I anticipate I'd, I'd even been in a position to do this. And and it's been also so other random things working with the likes of, uh, you know, going, going on programs like Sunday Brunch here again in, in the UK on Channel 4. That was great, you know, meeting people on there and chatting away to some of the celebrities. It was like we had, we had like Ashley Banjo from Diversity <laughs> having a good chat to him. And as it turns out, he did a degree, a bachelor's in, um, I think it was in natural history or something. He loves dinosaurs. So, <laughs> you know, we, we hit it off and was chatting about dinosaurs. So it, it's just such a, you know, and as I say, going back again, I'm probably rambling on a bit too much here, but, um, you know, with, with that, it's, it's one of those areas which I never really thought I would do anything in, but it's opened up many other doors as well. So cool. Yeah. And uh, would you still go into this industry knowing everything you know now? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah. no, no, I'm joking. Of course. Uh, no, I, I really would. And, and I think if anything, if I, if I know what I know now, and you know, if I knew that back, 13 years ago I'd be probably supercharged even more and and I'd just think to myself wow what a you know what a fascinating world there is to explore you know for paleontology and a lot of people often get 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 bogged down I should say with you know what I've talked about documentaries and things people have watched that and I'll say I want to be a paleontologist and you know I love dinosaurs all this sorts of stuff but when when you look at paleontology as a as the whole and this is why I talk about just kind of thinking outside the box You've got to try and look at the bigger picture of dinosaurs, for example, of such a tiny fraction of what paleontology is. And there's always going to be more opportunities to make it in this field by looking at other stuff that people aren't. That's what's important as well, I should say. Well, Dean, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. I've absolutely, I love your story. I love the drive and passion you had and, and the route you took to get where you are. It's just, it's really inspirational. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Yeah, thank you, Dean. Where can people find you on social media and uh, reach out if they need to? Yeah, I'm pretty active on social media, primarily on, on Instagram, Twitter, and, and I've got a public Facebook page as well. So that's just at Dean R. Lomax. But I also have my, my website as well if you want to learn a bit more about my background, some of the, the research that I do, my, my books and things, and that's just simply uh, DeanRLomax.co.uk. And where can people pick up your new book, Dean? 
Uh -huh. Well, you can buy that. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on. You can get it from Waterstones. You can get it from. Apparently, it should be in bookshops now as 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 well. But uh, <laughs> I I definitely recommend if you if you are interested in getting getting a hold of Locked in Time, I get it direct from the publisher, which is Columbia University Press. Brilliant. Thanks again, Dean. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure.